This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Sadie Eck. And we're your hosts. And uh, you are all probably wondering how the emancipation process is going and if we are, in fact, still sisters. Um, and I have some news for everybody. You're going to be very excited to uh, learn because I know she's been just not even remotely sick of us talking about, um, well, me, let me clarify, <laughs> me talking about emancipating from my sister. Uh, Sadie is my sister, for those of you who are listening for the first time and are like, this is the worst true crime podcast about sibling emancipation. But anyway, we are sisters. I'm always threatening to emancipate Sadie, always, all three previous episodes. Um, And (laughs) I looked it up and officially uh, it is not possible to to divorce your siblings. Um, (laughs) the internet says nothing resembling a legal divorce is required since there is no legal relationship to terminate. (laughs) One can simply go one's own separate ways. You know what I did this morning? First thing this morning, I woke up, I wake up early. My children wake up early and I Googled, can you emancipate your sibling? (laughs) (laughs) It's like, we're going to get to the bottom of this so we can just lay lay it aside and stop (laughs) bugging the shit out of people. Just you. So, I think the rest of the, I think our listeners are super entertained by this uh, intro <laughs> banter. Anyway, I know that's actually not the case at all. And you really want to hear about murder. Um, I'm go- we are going to get to murder very quickly and a really effed up murder at that. Um, but I quickly wanted to uh, try to say something without crying. Um, but a very good friend of ours was, well, that's actually, that's not true at all. She's kind of a friendly acquaintance. We don't actually know her very well, which is uh, such a testament to this person. Uh, her name is Kelly. She, we were friends in Portland. Uh, she, was a, she dated a friend of ours. That's how we met. Um, but she's a badass. She's an incredible human being. She started a domestic violence uh, group in Portland called Not OK PDX, I believe was the name of it. She was in bands. She's a D. I mean, she's just a total badass. Um, and she was unfortunately diagnosed with uh, inoperable brain tumor. I think about two years ago. She's been fighting like a total motherfucker, and unfortunately, it seems that she's being moved to hospice. Um, so we just wanted to. Um, we wanted to let her know that. We're all thinking about her and we love her and she's amazing. She's fought so hard. It's incredible that you can barely know somebody and then they completely change your life. So super up way to start the episode, but this episode and all subsequent episodes are dedicated to you. Kelly Favon, you're amazing. You're amazing. Um, (laughs) Regain my composure try to pretend like I don't feel feelings and just laugh at people all the time. <laughs> it's like I'm the biggest empath on the planet. So yeah, we love, we love you all. We love people very deeply and that's why we do this podcast. So right. uh, with that said, take it away, Sadie. This one <laughs> is a real barf, barfarama. I, it's, a, yeah, it's a really strange case. Um, and there's a lot about it that I did know from the headlines in the late 90s, early 2000s. And there's a tremendous amount I didn't. So Sadie, take it away. So today I'm going to tell you about the murder of Diane Whipple. Uh, this is a story that I had remember hearing about back in the early 2000s. And I thought that I knew the details. Um, but recently I came across an article in Rolling Stone magazine. Uh, it's titled Mad Dogs and Lawyers, written by Evan Wright. And as I was reading through it, I was I just kept 
being so surprised. <laughs> it's flabbergasting. It is a good opportunity <laughs> to use the word. I was flabbergasted, flabbergasted when Sadie sent me sort of the bullet points of the story. And I was like, yeah, zero of that information made it through the media. Yeah, I was shocked. Uh, so Diane Alexis Whipple was born January 21st, 1968 in Princeton, New Jersey. She was raised primarily by her grandparents uh, and was a gifted athlete from an, a young age. She grew up and attended high school in Manhasset, New York on Long Island, where she became a two-time All-American lacrosse player. After high school, she attended Penn State University on a lacrosse scholarship, where she was twice a member of the U.S. Women's Lacrosse World Cup team. Nice. Wait, yeah. I don't know sports enough to know. Of the nation? Is that a national team or um, a collegiate team? I it's good. This Sounds is good. Yeah, it's important. <laughs> it's a high level. I think it's okay. A, I think it's from the college. Yeah, I don't know. But it sounds like anyway. It sounds like that yeah. was amazing. She's an amazing athlete, is what. Right, and I do means. think it's as high as you, you can get in women's lacrosse. Badass. I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So after college, Diane moved to San Diego, California, and friends said that she eagerly embraced the challenge of exploring a new part of the country. In 1994, Diane met a woman named Sharon Smith through a mutual friend. Uh, they hit it off right away and moved in together a few months after meeting. They nice. loved to travel around the world. And during one trip, they exchanged drinks in a, in a private ceremony. Aww. Yeah. Sharon said, quote, if same-sex couples could legally marry in California, we absolutely would have. They dreamed of one day living in the country and raising children together. Sarah Miller who was a friend of the couple, described them by saying, quote, Sharon was a serious workaholic and Diane liked to goof off and have a good time. They kind of had a happy medium. They complimented each other really well. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Diane volunteered to coach a club. <laughs> this is a tongue twister. <laughs> Diane volunteered to coach a club lacrosse team at UC San Diego and did so well that she was offered a number of head coaching jobs at large universities that wanted to establish a women's lacrosse league. Amazing. Um, so at first she resisted coaching and she wanted to pursue her own athletic career. Uh, Diane came within seconds of qualifying for the U S 1996 Olympics team in track and field for the 800 Holy meters. Shit. That I, I know. understand. That I know is the best you can do. That's incredible. Is that college? I don't know. No. I, is that like a national thing? <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, yeah she's, she was an incredible athlete. Um, however, she did not compete at the Olympic team trials. Uh, shortly after this, Diane was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. No, no. Um, yeah, and Sharon said, quote, it was one of the toughest times for both of us, but it strengthened our bond. I bet. In May 1999, Diane, Sharon, and their two cats, Booty and Shadow, Cute. decided to move into an apartment in the Pacific Heights uh, neighborhood of San Francisco. Soon after, Diane became the lacrosse coach at St. Mary's College, California. Quote, she gave the game to these girls and they loved it, said Judy Massey, whose daughter played on one of Diane's teams. Diane's enthusiasm inspired her players. She would tease and push and joke with them and often was there to listen to their problems. One of Diane's lacrosse players said, quote, she was a role model. We would all look at her and say, I want to be it. I want to be Diane Whipple. Oh. I mean, as a coach too, you know, somebody who really obviously knows so much about sports. Um, <laughs> but I do, Sadie and I uh, share a love of inspirational sports, TV and movies, uh, not to mention the recent Netflix hit docu-series cheer <laughs> <laughs> coaches are the best mm -hmm. they're it's they're amazing it makes me regret not being more athletic as a kid because yeah. i mean you know we've joined plenty of group activities but i just can't imagine the feeling of touching that many lives like helping so many people and inspiring so many people and it sounds like she was one of the coaches that was exceptionally good at it well, in, in, in lacrosse too, which it sounds like uh, in the early 2000s was just sort of getting going for women yeah, yeah. Um, on the college level. And so to be, you know, they, I bet the members of her team just didn't see a lot of strong women lacrosse players. No doubt. Uh, so no doubt. On January 26, 2001, at around 4 p.m., Diane was returning to her Pacific Heights apartment after grocery shopping. She was carrying her groceries and, and trying to enter her apartment. 
Diane's neighbor, Marjorie Noller, was returning to her apartment as well after taking one of her two dogs, a Pressa Canario named Bane, out for a walk. And this is referencing the Rolling Stone article that we will definitely link in our show notes. Pressa Canario's quote were often touted as guardian dogs, as man stoppers, tough enough to take out pit bulls. Pressas mm-hmm. are holding or gripping dogs that were bred by Spanish cattlemen on the Canary Islands in the 16th century to pin, but pin down bulls for slaughter. I don't like the sound of holding or gripping dogs. It's like... No. <laughs> <laughs> they are what breeder, breeders call, quote, lip and ear dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and they immobilize much larger animals as bulls, like such as bulls, by clamping their jaws over their most vulnerable features, ah. their lips or their ears. God. Uh, American bread presses look like pit bulls, but they're about twice as big, sometimes weighing as much as 160 pounds. While Noller was trying to enter her apartment with Bane, her female Pressa Canario, Hera, so she had two of these huge dogs, uh, was at the doorway waiting. Hera noticed Diane in the, uh, in the hallway entering her own apartment approximately 60 feet away. According to Noller, Hera started growling at Diane. Noller had Bane restrained on a leash attached to a harness, but despite this, Bane became aroused upon hearing Hera's growling he too turned his attention to Diane and he began to pull Noller down the hall towards her. Oh my God. As he advanced, Noller fell and was dragged along behind Bane. It is likely that this is the point where Noller lost the ability to control the 125 pound dog. After Bane reached Diane, according to Noller, he stood on his hind legs and pinned the five foot three, 110 pound woman against the wall, straddling her shoulders with his four legs. That's so scary. Yeah, and this kind of, I mean, it's graphic and um, disturbing. So if I had a very hard time reading it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you want to skip ahead, you know, give us, I don't know, minute 30. uh, I I won't get too graphic, but it's it's not easy to listen to for sure. So just a heads up. Yeah. Uh, Noller claims that she then tried to push Diane into her apartment in an attempt to get away from Bane, but Diane resisted. In the struggle, struggle, Noller claims that Diane hit her in the eye and both fell to the floor. Diane at this point was trying to crawl away from Bane, uh, but his aggressive behavior towards Diane spiraled out of control. He started attacking Diane in a sustained, uninhibited, and frenzied manner. Noller claims that she tried to cover Diane with her body to protect her from Bane, and that every time Diane moved out from underneath Noller, Bane would attack. After about 10 minutes, I don't believe that. No. After about 10 minutes, Bane and possibly Hera, who may have joined in, stopped attacking. 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes. (sighs) A very long time. That's a very long time. Awful. So, and this, remember, is in a in a apartment building in San Francisco. So they're neighbors, and they have multiple other neighbors on their floor. Yep. Um, so neighbors who heard, heard Diane's screams were too afraid to enter the hallway to offer help. Do not blame them. Nope. Um, fearing the dogs would turn on them. They called 911 instead. Noller did not immediately offer aid to Diane. She said she went to go look for her keys. She did not call 911 for help. Yeah. Uh, That's not <clears throat> how you respond to your dog. Dogs, <laughs> your massive war dogs attacking your neighbor. No, like, where did I leave my keys? <laughs> right. Oh shoot! Don't tell me I left them at the grocery store. Like, yeah. No, like, just no. You get on your goddamn phone or get a stick or a bru- or like something. do anything. Yeah, a for to ten the minutes. Ten mm-hmm. minutes. You let this happen. Like that is mm-hmm. ten seconds is enough time to make a decision that you're bred to kill dogs are going to kill somebody and that you need to figure out something to do about it. I don't believe that she put her body over the woman's body. I think she probably stood and watched her dogs rip a woman to shreds. Well, yeah, we'll talk about it more in detail, but can't wait. it's not looking good for Marjorie. Miss no. Marjorie Noller. Uh, according to the article in Rolling Stone, Alec Cardenas, a SWAT team medic and one of the first cops on the scene, arrived about seven minutes after the first 911 call, to find the victim lying face down on the hall carpet in front of her apartment. She was naked. Um, The dogs had ripped off all of her clothes except for one sock. Oh, my God. Covered in blood, her upper back was punctured with dog bites. 
blood was splashed on the walls uh, for about 20 feet down the hall. Oh my God. 20 As feet. Oh God. 20 great. Feet. Into, I mean, we don't need to get into the details, but that is insane. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's really a long way. Um, as Cardenas approached, the woman attempt, attempted to push herself up and crawl into her home. Mm. So she was still alive after 10 minutes mm-hmm. being attacked by a dog. Oof. Yeah. Um, the article continues, quote, Marjorie Noller stepped out of apartment 604. She too was covered in blood. But aside from a cut on her hand and a few scratches on her arms, she was not injured. She told the police her story of what happened to Diane, adding, quote, I told her to stay still. If she had, this would never have happened. Noller told police she had managed to lock Bane and his mate Hera in her apartment. And she was afraid to go back inside. Uh, animal control officers found Bane in Noller's bathroom. The officers inched open the bathroom door and peeked inside. Uh, Bane was a massive creature. He weighed 120 pounds and was just under three feet tall. He had a brindle coat of black and tan tiger stripes. Most of his weight was centered in his powerful chest, uh, bulging legs and squat head, which was his most imposing feature. Bane had defecated all over the bathroom. He was soaked in blood and even his teeth were red. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just the thing that nightmares are made of. Absolutely. Uh, the animal control officers carried a tra- tranquilizer gun that shoots darts potent enough to knock out a large dog. They fired three into Bane and waited 15 minutes, but he remained standing. Two of the officers ended up hooking Bane with the catch poles, those poles with the yep. ropes around the bottom, uh, yep. and walked him down to their van where they euthanized him within a short time later. Yeah. That was probably a good bet. <laughs> Three tranks and he's still standing. What do we? Mm-hmm. What should we do? Let's just mm-hmm. see if he's adoptable. Yeah. As much as I loved horses uh, in middle school, I love dogs as much. Oh, yeah. But this dog needed it. That's enough. All done. <laughs> I mean, I go to the shelter regularly to <laughs> hang out with a dog. I love dogs so much, and that is so terrifying. And I'm not afraid of dogs. Sadie and I were raised to not be afraid of dogs. We always had like Rottweilers and pit bulls and German shepherds. <clears throat> Very familiar with big dogs. And that is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. But these are not normal big dogs. These are like no. literal hellhounds. <clears throat> I keep picturing the uh, Ghostbusters zoo yes, dogs. Yes. Yes. Like, that. Like, when there's pictures. Picture. Yeah. We'll post pictures of these dogs on, on social media, but um, that is pretty much exactly what they look like. Fuck not that. not even joking. No. Yeah. I have pugs. You can probably hear them snoring in the background. <laughs> like that is the level of dog <laughs> that. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah that's what you should much. have when you live in an apartment in San Francisco. For sure. Excellent. There are pugs. Yep. Yep. Not the hellhounds from not- Ghostbusters. <laughs> like gargoyles that have ripped themselves from the sides of buildings and moved into your. <laughs> two bedroom condo uh, give me a break. break yeah unbelievable so uh they euthanized the dogs and uh meanwhile D- diane was transported to the nearby hospital she sustained 77 77 mm. bite wounds God. that uncovered her entire body the most were se- the most severe were to her neck oh, all right God. guys this is this is this gets a little graphic um her larynx was crushed, and there was injury to her jugular vein and carotid artery. Uh, Some of the puncture wounds were so deep that they nearly severed her vertebrae. Oh, my God. After five hours at the hospital, Diane succumbed to her injuries. She had just celebrated her 33rd birthday, uh, just five days before her attack. Her official cause of death was cardiac arrest. Uh, she had lost nearly all of the blood in her body. It's just so awful it's so awful yeah yes <laughs> it is just about the worst thing you know, i can't right? i know no. i can't imagine i can't imagine staying alive through that and then continuing beyond that attack. No. i don't know it's just awful it's awful so the police first described diane's death as a tragic accident but after a tremendous amount of public outcry and as witnesses came to the police with stories of being bitten by the dogs, police changed their tune. Mm -hmm. They started looking into the owners of the dogs more closely. 
So Marjorie Noller, who was 46 at the time of Diane's death, and Robert Noel, who was 60, were both attorneys. Uh, going back to that Rolling Stone article, quote, outwardly, they, ex- they seemed exemplary San Franciscans. They were do-gooder attorneys honored by the Bar Association of San Francisco for their work helping the homeless and mentally disabled. Crazy. Uh, yeah, they were opera patrons who hobnobbed with some of the city's wealthiest citizens. Never trust a hobnobber. <laughs> come on that's our motto (laughs) yeah (laughs) yet both on the on their third marriage they had wed 12 years earlier and were seen by friends such as their colleague herman frank as being quote deeply in love and devoted to each other so just a quick background for the two of them Uh, robert noel married his high school sweetheart karen in 1963 a year later he entered law school at the university of baltimore and graduated in 1967 After graduation, Noel took a job in the Justice Department. Uh, In 1980, he moved west to become an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District Court of San Diego. He quit the U.S. Attorney's Office after a year and joined a prestigious corporate law firm in San Diego. By 1987, he had divorced Karen, his high school sweetheart, moved to San Francisco. He briefly married and then divorced a legal secretary. And then he met and fell in love with Marjorie Noller. Uh, This all took place in the space of about a a year. Oh, wow. Yeah, the divorce, the marriage, the divorce, (laughs) another marriage. Uh, Quote, I would trust my life in Marjorie's hands, is what Noel says. I wouldn't. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) No, clearly not. Nope. She's looking for her keys. My life is not not safe. Being held. (laughs) (laughs) So Noel's first wife, Karen, uh, he was married to her for 23 years, and she said, quote, Robert is mentally ill. <laughs> uh, there's no proof of this, by the way. But she also said that uh, his three children stopped having contact with him several years before the attack. Noel's son, a namesake, Robert Jr., said of his father, quote, he's a jackass. I don't like my dad, and I never have. I mean, that's all you really need to know about a person. If their kids mm-hmm. are like, nope, unless they haven't, yeah, yeah they, no, that's plenty of information. Right, absolutely. Uh, Marjorie Noller grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and dreamed of becoming an FBI agent at a young age. Her mother, Harriet, said, quote, Marjorie didn't go with a crowd. She skipped her high school graduation. She told me, Mom, I'm not going. All the kids in my class are on drugs. Don't be a square, Marjorie. <laughs> Noller graduated from McGeorge School of Law in Sacramento, California. Uh, she met Robert Noel when she was 32, shortly after graduating from law school. Uh, She was just starting her career at the firm where Noel was already a big shot. They made a lunch date one day and moved in together a week later. Ah, you just got to love it. Mm -hmm. So in May 1988, they both had quit their jobs and started their own firm, focusing more on pro bono work. One of their new clients was a guard at Pelican Bay State Prison who had recently broken ranks with fellow corrections officers by testifying on the behalf of inmates who had been brutalized in the prison. And I did read some about that, and it sounds like Pelican Bay at the time was nasty, really awful. Yeah, I don't think it's still a very, like, super fun place to look Mm. to be, but it's pretty notoriously awful prison. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And now he was being harassed on the job and wanted to sue the California Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. Noller and Noel leapt at the chance to represent him, and after this, they focused on representing prison guards with grievances against the CDC. So that's like a good guy thing to do, though, right? Yeah. Like he was, they yeah. were representing guards who were trying to do the right thing and being like terribly harassed as a result. Yeah. And there's not a lot that, of this. Not that of... I'm setting them up to be good guys, but for, no. like for all intents and purposes, they were exemplary citizens and, and lawyers. Like they weren't mm-hmm. shady, like injury lawyers or something. They were actually right. like presenting trying as good best. people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but despite their devotion to their cause, Noller and Noel racked up an uneven, some say abysmal record. They lost the harassment case for their first client, and he mm. subsequently hanged himself. Oh, no. Uh, Susan Beck, who analyzed their cases against the CDC in an article in the record, uh, no, I'm sorry, in the recorder, uh, Bay Area Legal Newspaper, concluded that Noller and Noel often made basic procedural mistakes and developed legal strategies based on unsupported conspiracy theories. Ooh. Yeah. Cool. So not the defense lawyers that you need. <laughs> <laughs> Just, 
<laughs> hey, I read something from this cult leader that we could probably cite for this case. <laughs> well, I picture their like their commercial on TV. You know, hey, will we develop our legal strategies based on unsupported conspiracy theories? <laughs> yeah. We consult with some kid who lives in his mom's basement. He's thirty-five, and he has a lot of very interesting things to say about um, aliens. That's uh, right. So call Noel or Noel at one eight hundred. Fuck that shit. <laughs> Catchy, <laughs> get stuck in your head. They're jingle. One eight hundred five ten two. This is why I don't crack the jokes. It's too hard to get serious again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, quote: Noel comes across as someone who is competent, but appears to me, uh, but it appears to me that there have been serious problems with his conduct on some cases. Says Neil Sanders, who's an expert on prison law. They were clearly in over their heads and had no experience with the prison system. Mm-hmm. The low point, the low point of their legal career came in 1997 when they defended a, a Pelican Bay guard who was accused of colluding with the Aryan Brotherhood to set up child molesters for beatings and murders. Um, so their defense failed, and not only was the guard found guilty, but one of the inmates that they called as a witness was subsequently murdered. Yikes! Yeah, if your people are hanging themselves and getting murdered, you're not doing a very good job. <laughs> no, you're doing the opposite of a good job. Mm-hmm. So as investigators looked into the couple's private lives more closely, they found secrets that baffled them. Uh, Only a few days after Diane's death, they had adopted an inmate at California's Pelican Bay State Prison. Uh, He he said adopted an inmate. Right, adopted an inmate. Uh, He was a 39-year-old man serving a life term for armored car robbery and attempted murder. I mean, if that's not the biggest, like, what the fuck of all time... (laughs) I would love to be adult adopted by, you know, what are those Nate Burkus and his husband, Jeremiah. I would love to be adult <laughs> adopted by, you know, somebody very wealthy and <laughs> you do too. He like has the line at target. He's very be- beautiful, oh, okay. just like stunningly mm-hmm. beautiful gay couple that mm-hmm. just seems so lovely to be around. Like if they adult adopted me, great. But <laughs> <laughs> was picking a kid picking a 40 year old out of the prison system being like mommy and daddy love you mm-hmm. <laughs> picture the judge like i love watching the videos of people getting adopted to just happy <laughs> cry with some tatted yeah. up piece of garbage <laughs> like no i'll never have to mm-hmm. be without a family again so their quote son paul cornfed schneider uh, who was one of the most feared leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood <laughs> prison gang, <laughs> was facing federal charges for racketeering and a series of murders he allegedly orchestrated from behind bars at the time of Diane's death. So, so real quick, just to recap, middle name Cornfed or nickname Cornfed? <laughs> nickname Cornfed, that's what he was known in the, as, that's what they called him in, in prison. Leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, yep. right? One of the leaders, yep. So they adult adopted corn fed who mm-hmm. was one of the leaders of the Aryan brotherhood in prison, mm-hmm. in federal prison. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So cool. who is, a, who is not only it's like in basically there for a Christmas life. movie. It's like a, like a Christmas Hallmark Christmas <laughs> movie. <laughs> God. Yeah. <laughs> um, he was not only was he in prison already for a life term, but he was also facing federal charges for racketeering and murders that he had orchestrated. Yeah, nobody's surprised. Or behind bars. Right. So, again, going back to the Rolling Stone article, quote, Schneider thrived in a brutal prison environment, pitting his will against the authorities every chance he had. In 1990, when he was brought into a courthouse under heavy guard to testify in a case involving another inmate, uh, Schneider, we can call him corn-fed, pulled a knife he had fashioned from a prison soup ladle and stabbed a defense attorney several times. Oh, my God. Uh, the article keeps saying or goes on to say, like a magician guarding the secret behind a trick, Schneider has never re- revealed how he smuggled the weapon into the courtroom. Though his victims' wounds contain unmistakable clues, they were infected with fecal matter. I mean, we all saw that coming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when asked why he stabbed the attorney, he said, "Quote: I didn't like his attitude, his smart Alec remarks, nor his demeanor, so I stabbed him." In retrospect, it was a bad idea. 
Cornfed had become acquaint- acquainted with Noel and Noller through their legal work at Pelican Bay. He was one of the witnesses they called during one of their trials. Uh, as police looked into the connection between Schneider, Cornfed, and his adoptive parents, they learned he and a cellmate, uh, whose name was Dale Bridges, had plans in place to operate a web base web-based dog breeding business from prison named Dog O War Kennels. Oh my god. Uh, its purpose was to breed and sell aggressive Presa Canarios to members of the Aryan Brotherhood. Of course it was. Um, Schneider arranged for Noel and Noller to obtain, obtain Bane and Hera from a woman named Janet Coombs. She would make humanitarian visits to Pelican Bay as, uh, you know, like a, quote, good Christian woman. She would go. Yep. Uh, she befriended Cornfed. Um, and as a favor to him, she agreed to maintain and breed the dogs on a small farm she owned in Hay Fork, California. Yep. Um, and two of these dogs were Bane and Hera. They were delivered to Coombs as pups from different breeders. Um, and after the delivery, she maintained regular contact with Schneider, mm-hmm. sending him weekly letters and photos keeping up to date on the dogs, keeping him up to date on the dogs. One photo showed Bane cuddling with a cat, and this enraged, enraged corn fed. Quote, you're making a wuss out of Bane, he wrote. These are royal dogs and they need and they need to look majestic. Uh, several months later, Schneider and Coombs had a falling out. According to Schneider, the root of their conflict was romantic. Uh, after Schneider says he turned down Coombs' romantic advances, she stopped sending letters and visiting him altogether. Coombs has also told investigators that Schneider threatened her. Quote, things can happen to you and your home, he allegedly told her. Um, at the time of the article, when the article was written, uh, she was reportedly in the witness protection program. Oh my God, from him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just to be clear, yeah. Schneider and Cornfed are the same person. Just in case that's yeah. confusing, it's good. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Schneider. Tired. <laughs> <laughs> as endearing a nickname as Cornfed is, his it's, last name is Schneider. A little jarring. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and he forced her into the witness protection program because she was, I mean, I would be too. Are you freaking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Like the Aryan brotherhood uh, yeah. is after me there. No, Nope. Right. See ya. Yeah. If you're able to pull together resources to start a dog kennel, like you can definitely call yeah, on an your... online dog kennel. There's not, you don't have computer access to run your murder dog blog from right. prison. <laughs> I'm positive of that. Like you can, yeah occasionally skype a loved one but that's about as far as well let's remember too that this was late 90s early 2000s so there was like good point very basic internet no skyping (laughs) excellent yeah (laughs) takes like four to seven minutes to even get the connection going Mm -hmm. and then uh aol aol chat rooms that's the internet (laughs) so you must have been selling those dogs via chat Mm mm-hmm uh, so via via Schneider's orders, Coombs was re- directed to turn the dogs over to Noel and Noller. Um, on April 1st, 2000, Noel and Noller and several others arrived at Coombs Farm and took possession of seven dogs. Noel recalls seeing Bane for the first time, quote, Bane was confident, proud, handsome, he says, adding, Bane had an eye for ladies. He sees Marjorie, rolls over on his back, and bam, that big red arrow popped out. He oh had a heart on that big. God. Yeah. And then Noel gestures with his hands to indicate Bane's penis length and then grins. That's, uh, yeah, we don't even need to talk about how disgusting this guy is. Yeah. No, it makes me, to read that out loud makes me sick to my stomach. Do you want to, do you want to read it again just in case anybody <laughs> <No>. <laughs> missed any of the no, nuance of that poetry? Yeah. well and it's not even the quote isn't even over <laughs> oh no I'm so we're almost sorry. there we're almost there I'm that's so okay sorry. i'm so sorry um, to you everybody loses with this story not a yeah. winner in sight right so after noel's gestures with his hands he says quote boy was that dog hung oh god okay yeah i'm not even gonna go uh, so after spending time in different locations, Hera and Bane eventually arrived to Noel and Noller's apartment in early September, uh, which was about five months before the mauling happened. Keith Whitley, who was a friend uh, of Noller and Noel, noticed a change in them right away. Quote, I'd get on the phone with Bob, which is Robert Noel, 
uh, Mm -hmm. to ask him about a case, he says. And all he did was talk about how big Bane's balls were. What? Why? Mm -hmm. That's so weird. Yeah, and this friend would visit uh, their apartment. He visited their apartment about a week before the fatal attack. He said, quote, they used to have this charming flat. The dogs turned it into a piss pot. Bob had to bring the dogs out one at a time when introduced when he introduced them to me because he couldn't control them. So, so and I think about how if you know Robert couldn't control the dogs, yeah, uh, Marjorie Noel or Noller, she was much smaller, yep, than her husband. And what were these guys thinking? Is and, pretty no. much the theme of the story. <laughs> that's exactly right well and when you said like that that's the point where she lost control of the dog like no the moment the dog was born was the moment that everybody mm-hmm. lost control of the dog like yeah uh Noller and noel began writing letters and sending dog pictures to schneider several mm-hmm. times a week uh becoming close to him Noller says she first floated the idea of adopting schneider explaining quote by adopting paul we now have a say in his medical treatment if something bad happens to him in prison, we can sue. We adopted him to give him protection. Oh, how um, noble. Mm-hmm. Psychopaths. Right. So this is legally true, but it doesn't explain the couple's interest in this violent inmate. Right. Um, Noller suggests that she and Schneider had a lot in common, such as mutual interests in The Hobbit and in runes. <laughs> You know, rooms. R U N E S. Yes. Not room. Not rooms and houses. <laughs> no rooms. Um, like the, the, the tiles. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. She said, "Quote: Paul has an inner life he shares with us. Um, he's special. He's our kid, and we love him." <sighs> See, to say kid, like it's one thing to. I get it for legal reasons. You know, if you want, if you actually love someone and you need to protect them by adopt adult adopting them by like, by all means. And honestly, like I joke about adult adoption, but I've always thought if I was going to get a, have a kid, adopt a kid, I would adopt an older kid who's aging out of the foster mm-hmm. system because Absolutely. they need your help. They don't have a family. You know, what do they do now? Like it's like, there's a million reasons to do something like that. Mm-hmm. And I'm very much in favor of all of them, but not like, <laughs> I met this Nazi. He's into runes. We love the Hobbit. <laughs> what if he gets sick? You know what? I better help. What him. if he gets sick? <laughs> exactly. Like, guy's yeah. got a real target on his back. He's been breeding murder dogs. He really hates people of color. Something bad could happen, and I want to be prepared to sue. Mm-hmm. Like, well, it gets cool. even better. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. Yeah. Um, so it's it. <laughs> Yeah, this sounds great and all, but if it's true that she really thought of him as her child and she loved him, um, it doesn't explain erotic letters and nude photos that were allegedly shared with Schneider. Yeah, let's get um, down to the heart of the matter. I mean, mm-hmm. that's not a big surprise, I'm sure, to anybody. But yeah, and there were even some reports that these letters and photos contained Im- images of bestiality. Mm-hmm. Um, Noller. So Noller allows that, quote, threesomes are a pretty standard erotic fantasy, she says. It's a tradition to write erotic letters to inmates. It helps them. This is a quote from Marjorie It's a Noller. tradition. <laughs> yeah. Then she tries a different tact and says, quote, Paul was writing a novel, an erotic medieval fantasy. We wrote chapters back and forth. We were all characters in it. She says that along the way, quote, I flashed my breast in some pictures Bob might have sent one of these to Paul. There was nothing with dogs. Okay. I am totally down with all different kinds of kinks and however you want to express yourself. And, you know, by all means, write in an erotic novel, include your wife's breasts in it. Mm -hmm. But you're not going to tell me that the guy that's obsessed with his dog's privates. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just said the word privates. Uh, (laughs) didn't include bestiality and right like, well uh, and it was corn I mean, fed where corn fed was writing the, the story oh he was writing the they novel. were just they were just offering giving him fuel material fantasies mm-hmm. yeah, right booby pictures <laughs> they were his muses. you say privates i say booby pictures <laughs> <sighs> i mean We've just like lost many, many <laughs> IQ points. So much intelligence has been sapped from mm-hmm. our minds, bodies, and souls. So yeah. 
I, this is the best you're going to get out of us guys for the rest of this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah. The subject matter. I mean, yeah. it's like if somebody, it sounds like a, it really sounds like a teenage boy wrote this story in general, right? Mm-hmm. Like a 15 year old is like, yes. and then and yeah. Nazis and like, mm-hmm. it's, it's just so much stranger than fiction. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, As authorities began to look into Diane's death, it became clear quickly that the dogs had been aggressive in the past and one had even bit Diane previously. Uh, Sharon. So now we're getting back into into the reality of things. Uh, Sharon, who was Diane's partner, uh, said one of her biggest regrets was not reporting the first bite to animal control. She wonders if that would have saved Diane's life. Uh, It's so hard. Like we've, most of us I think have come in contact with some a dog or been bitten or have been around Mm -hmm. someone who's been bitten and like if you love dogs or you're a good person Mm -hmm. generally you're probably just gonna like let it go because you don't want to kill somebody's pet it's super devastating it's so sad yeah and some of the reports I think it it wasn't even like a full-on bite it was more of a snap you know, like yep. the dog snapped at her. Yeah. Um, I got conflicting reports, but it wasn't serious. It wasn't like a serious dog bite. Uh, yep. I know that Diane had talked about being afraid of the dogs. Yeah. Uh, mentioned to her friends that there was these huge hellhounds and she was scared. But yeah, it's hindsight's 2020 and you don't want to be, you know, I, I just get it. I understand. I totally wanna, get it. You want to hope that these people have these dogs and know what they're doing. Um, Bain got into a fight with a dog at, at a beach four days after he arrived in San Francisco. And uh, during the fight, he nearly snapped Noel's finger clean off. Oh, God. Um, yeah, and the previous owner, Janet, <laughs> she, the previous owner of the dogs also claimed that they killed and ate her sheep, chickens, and a house cat. Oh, guys, that's not a good track record. I like, know. Yeah. Uh, no, another thing that strengthened the case against the couple was a rambling 18 page letter that Noel sent to uh, the San Francisco district attorney uh, in which he denied any responsibility for the, the killing. In the letter, he speculates the perfume Dan- Diane was wearing or the fact that she may have been on steroids provoked his dogs to attack. Yeah, he can go fuck himself. That's mm-hmm. disgusting. Yeah, he Awful. also went on to blame Diane for her own death, saying instead of going into her apartment and closing the door, she walked towards the dogs and hit Noller in the face, and that's when she was attacked. Yeah. Um, but this was not the same story that Noller had told the police the day of the God, I, I hate these people so yeah. much. Uh, yeah. Witness, I mean, victim blaming, victim blaming, victim blaming. Well, and they're very obviously all have personality disorders. And like one person with a personality disorder is destructive enough and then get three of them together and just forget about it. Like this just, I really believe in people. You know, even though I I listen to True Crime all day, every day, like I really do love and care about people and believe in people and have a lot of hope for humanity. And then you hear something like this and you're like, God, it really does get that dark because it's sort of easier to understand psychopathy like somebody who's a serial killer like they really probably can't you know they just they're doomed that's who they are darkness is in there it's not nothing you can do about it but these three like fueling each other's fucked up fires it's 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 so much more disturbing to me because they could have talked themselves out of it or you know there's Mm -hmm. like a billion interventions that they could have done with each other that would have stop this from happening yeah yeah they're just 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 awful people Mm -hmm. so on tuesday march 27th uh, 2001 after being indicted by a grand jury marjorie noller and robert noel were arrested for the murder of diane whipple good Uh, thank god (laughs) noller was charged with second degree murder and they were both charged with involuntary manslaughter and uh, for keeping a mischievous dog uh, Robert Noel was out of town during the attack. Mm-hmm. He wasn't there at so all, and so lucky. she was. Yeah, she was the one that got the the bigger charge. Noller's bail was set at two million dollars, and Noel's bail was set at one million. Good. Yeah, their trial started on February twentieth, uh, two thousand and two, in Los Angeles, California. Uh, the story was so big in San mm-hmm. Francisco that they had to move the trial. 
Yeah, I remember it even in where, yeah, mm-hmm. I guess I was in California then, but I remember this mm-hmm. case so clearly. Mm-hmm. At trial, Noller wove an almost moving tale of how she risked her life uh, trying to save Diane's and then blew whatever sympathy she was gaining by saying that Bane had sniffed Diane's crotch, quote, like she was a bitch in heat. Ah, uh, just like, yeah. you think they can't get any grosser. Mm-hmm. Uh, witnesses testified that Noller and Noel had repeated, repeatedly refused to control the dogs. Uh, A professional dog walker testified that uh, after she told Noel to muzzle his dogs, he told her to, quote, shut up and called her offensive names. Uh, Sure. An acquaintance of Noel's testified that he did not apologize after Hera bit him a year before the fatal attack. So these dogs Uh, were just biting and eating. I mean, we've established that, but like they were very well aware that their dogs were very dangerous animals. Right. It wasn't like they were just timid little things that suddenly attacked. Yep. Um, So back to the Rolling Stone article, quote, if Noller and Noel were simply on trial for acting like jerks, this would be an open and shut case. (laughs) (laughs) such an astute thing to say <laughs> it's too bad i know it's too bad there's not jerk court and jerk jail it's like some people just need to go to jerk jail it's like enough well, is enough you haven't actually yeah. done anything that we can you know charge you for a crime but that's mm-hmm. just too much jerk i mean these guys think i mean i'm so no. glad that they were actually charged for the crime because they are 100 percent responsible for that woman's death we'll get but, into it more oh good yeah. Um, so Noller's lawyer. Oh, and I'm real quick. Um, there is an American justice episode. Do you remember that show? Heck yeah. Um, I think it's so on on this case. It could be. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I have fond memories. I used to watch it a lot when I was in Portland and, uh, but anyway, we don't need to go down that memory lane. (laughs) No, let's talk Um, about every episode you watched in (laughs) order, please. (laughs) So there's an episode of the that covers the case, and they show a lot of the trial footage. Um, and so when uh, Noller's lawyer, Nedra Ruiz, who in this American Justice episode is, she's this tiny little woman and is like, she should win an Oscar for best actor, acting. Mm-hmm. She, <laughs> they, everybody needs to go check it out. <clears throat> she delivered opening arguments that lasted over three hours. What? Um, at times breaking down into tears so the lawyer was crying no Um, she exhaustively recounted and reenacted the fatal attack kneeling down or throwing herself on the floor and waving her microphone as she described described her client's role in the attack as heroic i mean where did these all these jerks find each other speaking of jerk court that's (laughs) unbelievable yeah really should go watch the footage it's it's the description doesn't do it justice. Um, wow. It's really over the top. While the prosecution said Noller had ample time to stop the, the attack, the defense said her client tried as hard as she could to stop it. Noller, who, was, who actually took the stand, um, was said to have, quote, sobbed and screamed for three days when she took the witness stand in her own defense. She testified that the prosecution witnesses who described aggressive incidents of Bain uh, or Harrow were either mistaken or exaggerating, or that mm-hmm. the incidences never occurred. She also right. said that the dogs were never subjected to any formal training designed to, to instill aggressive behavior, and she had no idea that they could be so vicious or ever kill someone. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, witnesses were called for the defense to back Noller's claims that, do- that the dogs were out in public, uh, especially in the lobby of the apartment. And mm-hmm. all the time and that they were well-behaved and not aggressive. And the defense showed pictures of Noller after the attack covered in blood uh, with scratches and a bite mark, one bite mark on her hand is proof that she tried to save Diane from the attack. Yeah, well, that the blood was 20 feet down the hallway, so no doubt she got some on her body in right. the attack. Like, the entire right. apartment is covered in Diane's or Diane's blood. Like, Yes. Well, oh. and one bite... When, yeah, you know, Diane yeah, you was fought so hard to save her destroyed life. Destroyed by these dogs. Give me a break. Yeah, yeah. 
So after spending three days in deliberation on March 21st, 2002, the jury found Marjorie Noller and Robert Noel guilty of all charges. Thank God. Although the jury found Noller guilty of second degree murder, uh, the trial judge, James Warren, granted Noller a new trial on the second degree murder conviction. The judge believed for Noller to be convicted of second degree murder, uh, which is based on the theory of implied malice. Right. Noller must have known that her conduct involved a high probability it would re- result in the death of another. So by bringing her dog out in the hallway, she would have to know that it would result in Diane's death. I mean, and he, he didn't believe definitely that arguable. She, yeah. Yeah. And he didn't believe that she was aware uh, that her dogs could or would kill her neighbor. Right. Uh, I'm not going to try to be a legal scholar here even right. for a second, but right. it, it is it is a tricky, like, did she really think that bringing the dogs out would kill someone? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. But when you're associating and adopting white supremacists, <laughs> yeah, be, you know, yes. like well, and these, they're these... not a peace loving bunch of people. And those dogs were specifically bred for a very, clear purpose so Mm -hmm. in this case in general great no problem like pit bulls and dogs who can become aggressive i understand we you know everybody i say to used to have a pit bull everybody had you know everybody i love has aggressive big aggressive you know can be aggressive breeds but Mm -hmm. yes bullshit (laughs) like you knew that those dogs were eventually going to kill something if not someone Mm -hmm. it's just yeah well they already had multiple times yeah, my sweet, sweet pit bull mix that I had was great with people, but uh, was not great with other dogs. And I remember wanting to get an apartment with her in Portland. And I had, I turned it down because I didn't, I couldn't trust her with being in close proximity with other dogs. No. Like I was able to make that choice to right. keep other people safe. <laughs> like yeah. It's just something you have didn't, to do to be a responsible dog You didn't keep my, my curtains and my Tempur-Pedic safe because she saw a <laughs> raccoon through my bedroom window and attacked yeah, my and destroyed it. <laughs> my curtains and my Tempur-Pedic instead yeah. of the raccoon. So, <laughs> no, she was I'm crazy. charging you a second degree. Yeah, she was so <laughs> sweet and terrifying. <laughs> but anyway, so although the judge granted a new trial for the second degree murder charge, the other charges still stood. Um, Mm -hmm. So he sentenced Noller and Noel to four years in prison for involuntary manslaughter. That doesn't sound like nearly enough. I'm glad it's something, but it's like, that's just... No, no. Not nearly enough. Life was worth more than, obviously, worth more than that. Yeah, and the severity Um, of the attack and all the... Yeah, and I'm not going to go... There was years and years and years of appeals for this case and oh i can sh- find I, i'll link articles if you want to go find the details i'm not going to i'm not going to bore you with all the back and forth yeah. um but the state did appeal the judge's actions and sought to reinstate the second degree murder conviction oh wow um which then led to this the years of appeals battles um so by 2004 both noel and uh, noller had served their terms for manslaughter uh, and Noller was out on bail while her second degree murder conviction was under appeal. Right. Um, so finally, on September 22nd, 2008, the San Francisco Superior Court uh, reinstated the conviction for second degree murder. Yep. The, the court sentenced Noller to 15 years to life. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. And she was sent back to prison. Uh, Holy and is currently, shit. Yeah. <laughs> She's currently serving her sentence at Valley State Prison for Women uh, oh, in California. I am so, I didn't realize that. I don't know if I, gl- my eyes glazed over when I read that. Generally, I read <laughs> Sadie's reporting once and then kind of like I, you know, read it just to make sure that the flow is good and things. And then I try to put it out of my mind. So I am having like, but in this case, I don't remember reading that at all. I'm <laughs> extremely happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. Wow, 15 years to life. Um, so just re- about a year ago, February 7th, 2019, the California commissioners denied Noller's first application for parole. She will be eligible to apply for parole again in 2002. Or no, <laughs> she will be <laughs> she will be eligible to apply for parole again in 2022. Yep, very soon. Yeah, 
<clears throat> on June 22nd, 2018, uh, Robert Noel died of heart failure. Oh, uh, bummer. In, yeah, in a, in a nursing home. Uh, he died on his 77th birthday. Uh, he lived in relative obscurity following his release from prison, uh, working for a time as a baker in California. Uh, by 2016, increasing health problems led him to living out of a van for some time. That's uh, better. Before, now we're talking. Yeah, <laughs> before he relocated to San Diego. <clears throat> Report said that Noel was able to reconcile with his son before he died. Nope. Nope. I mean, and probably good for his was, son. Yes. If it was a cathartic experience for his son and something his son needed for closure, good. But I hope Noel got no satisfaction out of that interaction whatsoever. Yeah, uh, so can we, let's talk about Diane. I want to yes, go please, back and please, please get rid of all of this awfulness, awfulness for a minute. <clears throat> yep. So a week after Diane's death, um, Sharon Smith, so Diane's partner, Mm. Uh, they were together for seven years she met with an attorney uh, who told her she couldn't sue for a wrongful wrongful death oh, because God. she wasn't diane's legal spouse it just puts tears in my eyes it's too yeah, no. unbelievably sad i mean it's something that i look thank god i was able to legally marry my spouse but who it is gonna make me cry it's oh. just it's so sad it's so sad people had to go through that it really is. It's really unfair. Yep. I mean, more than unfair. It's immoral. It's immoral. And it's just so devastating. Yeah. Don't make me cry. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she was told by the attorney that she couldn't sue. Um, and that seemed unbelievable and unfair to Sharon. Yep. Uh, the attorney told her that, uh, but that the attorney told her that that was the law and Sharon replied, quote, well, let's change the law then. Fuck. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah. crying for different I know, reasons. Me too. <laughs> That's so, so good. She went on to make history when San Francisco Superior Court Judge A. James Robertson allowed her to proceed with her wrongful death lawsuit, although she was not a legal spouse. Fuck um, yeah. The case would eventually lead to California state legislation, which was lobbied uh, for by Sharon, that strengthened the rights of domestic partners in California. Uh, prior to the case, there was no precedent to allow same-sex partners to sue for wrongful death. Yeah, so it's just like I, going through something that awful is not, I mean, like, goes without saying. Nobody should ever, ever have to go through something that awful. But doing that for other gay people I'm a gay person. Like I can speak from experience that, you know, it's such a vulnerable way to be, especially in the nineties and early two thousands, like nothing was safe there, you know, just being was not a safe thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so to fight that hard after going through something that horrible so that other people wouldn't have to go through it. It's going to make me cry again, but it is, mm -hmm. that's phenomenal. Like she yeah. did so much good through doing that. Yeah, she she's in the American Justice episode and um, is you can just tell that she's uh, very smart and a total badass, but wouldn't want to doesn't have the personality that would want to be out in the middle of the spotlight. Um, right, and she really did become a gay rights activist and activist in California, and I think there were reports that she was like in parades at the, at the gay pride parade. They really celebrated her for what mm. she did. You know, that, that's <laughs> um, <clears throat> major, wonderful. Yeah, I'll post. There was a bunch of articles um, about the the win that she got uh, in the newspapers. I'll be sure to post those so people can Absolutely. can take a read. Yep. Um, so she, uh, after being allowed to <laughs> to uh, go ahead with her wrongful death suit. Uh, she then went on to win. The yes, yes, she, yes, yes. Yeah, she was awarded one point five million dollars. Holy shit! Um, and she donated a portion of the settlement to the Diane Whipple Endowed Women's Lacrosse Scholarship at St. Mary's College, where Diane coached. Uh, oh. The scholarship helped women obtain a quality education while competing in lacrosse at the college level. This, there's enough. Cry I've cried too much. I'm I know. Gonna <laughs> keep crying, and it's so beautiful. 
Sharon is quoted as saying, quote, I owe it to her to live life as if she were here and move forward. She will be with me. She will always be with me. That's right, girl. Yep. Oof. I'm crying. <laughs> I know. I do. Oh. Uh, God. Oh. Roller coaster. No. That is the unbelievable and terribly tragic story of the Diane most Whipple. tragic story but then very beautiful. I mean, yeah. we can, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to not try not to cry through this part, but it's like we were saying with my friend, our friend Kelly at the beginning. Um, I don't think that the people who love the people who die take much comfort in this is my guess. Um, in knowing how profoundly they've affected other people. But I like thinking about my inevitable passing. I just hope that, I can touch people on the mm-hmm. slightest level that she's touched people and changed their lives and that Diane did before she died. And it's like, it's overwhelming, you know? Yeah. That's all we can ask for. It's all, I mean, I just, I will be very happy if I'm like on the other side, like shit. Yeah. Look at all those Facebook <laughs> posts. That's amazing. <laughs> I don't know if Kelly's Facebook profile is public, but all of her friends, she got a switchblade tattoo down the side of her face, which is so fucking badass. I'm assuming it's pointing to her tumor, um, but all of her friends are getting them in honor of her and posting them on her Facebook page. And if you want a good cry, because you didn't get a good enough cry just now, go over there and check it out. Um, yeah. Well, also, I meant to say this earlier, we will post her mother has uh, been in charge of caring for her for the better part of two years. And so there's a GoFundMe um, to help support her. And we'll post that on our uh, social media as well. If anybody's Absolutely. moved to donate. Anyway. Yeah. Um, really good job. I hate those people with a burning passion, mm-hmm. but I love Diane Whipple and I love her partner and I love Kelly Fabon and I even love, I love you. you. <laughs> I have to now that For I'm now. stuck with you and I'm unable to emancipate from you mm. until I've... I do the <laughs> brave thing and legislate yeah. for sibling emancipation rights That's right where maybe we can adopt each other and then emancipate from one another <laughs> <laughs> problem solved <laughs> oh uh, shit all right so this is going long um yes and we'll wrap it up by saying you can follow us on twitter instagram and facebook at they will kill uh you can email us at they will kill podcast at gmail.com our website is theywillkill.com um a big rate, thank you review huh? subscribe rate, rate review, review subscribe subscribe please. please absolutely and as always a humongous thank you to aj bergantz for our beautiful theme music we love it so much still <laughs> we love it so much <laughs> All right. Are Thanks you, you guys for out? listening. Thanks for listening. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, and remember, um, shit, I'm totally unprepared. What's a good lyric? Don't stop. Oh, one eight hundred. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> That's what you. That was the jingle for <laughs> Noel and Nardon. What are their names? I don't know what their last names are. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just trail off. That doesn't even make sense. It trails <laughs> off. <laughs> no, no. I, don't, I hate them so much. Goodbye. Goodbye.